I knew we would eventually figure that out at some point or another. <laughs> I, I'm taking a good guess that uh, Instagram has decided. By the way, um, just real quick, Warren, I see you. Hannah. No offense, my, no offense. I'm going to say hi to you. And uh, you got Hannah here uh, for you. Give a give a wave out to Hannah there. Uh, let me let me do that because I'm tired of hearing music. Um, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. I you know I I have no idea what happened there. Uh, you were showing up, but it but literally Instagram was telling me they were not going to allow me to have your camera turned on, and I was going like, what? I have no idea what that meant. No, really, literally. Like I tried three times, and it kept telling me. Say that again. They didn't want me to be seen. I, <laughs> uh, that should never happen to you. They knew that, that some crazy shit was going to come out of my mouth. Nah, They're like, well, let's keep this girl quiet. <laughs> no, nah, we can't have that happen. That's why, I, that's why I wanted you to be the first person after I took a few days off to be the first person I have on the show. <laughs> um, yeah, that was. I, I have never had that happen. I literally tried it three times, and it told me no. And I was like, are you kidding me? I'm looking. At, I mean, I see your name right there. Anyhow, enough with that. Now, I, got to, I had to vent. I had to vent a little bit at Instagram. I don't know what was happening. Please. Okay. I need your help. Because, need see, people, people write into my shows, this yeah. channel and my Narc Abuse TV, of yes. what they want to see and hear. Yes. yes. And 80% of the time, I give them what they want. You know, uh, except for the crazy stuff, I, I can't, I can't do it. But like uh, they wanted like what? someone. What's the crazy stuff? <laughs> uh, uh, uh. If I tell you, <laughs> if I tell you, no, I, I can't. But I'll one day you will see I'll want to turn my camera something. off. I want to turn my camera <laughs> yeah, off. You'll probably, okay. yeah, right, yeah. Okay. They ask for some things that I know I'm not going to do. Uh, <laughs> that that will get me in trouble because I w didn't say I wouldn't do them. I just won't do it on camera. All right, so so, um, okay, you got people. People coming in. Are these your friends coming in? Um, Hannah is. According okay. to my <laughs> You go are, like, hey. yes. Hannah, Hannah is. Okay, that's a good thing. All right, here we go. People wanted to talk uh, about this subject, and I found you. Um, and I said, I've got to get you to be the person who spearheads talking about adult children of alcoholics. Mm -hmm. That's not it. That's not this. This is one. Never heard of that. <laughs> uh, okay, then then I'll do this. Hey, I can pivot because I know you're messing with me. Scapegoat, mm -hmm. toxic shame, codependency, mm -hmm. owning your own story. Mm. All of them is that's your wheelhouse. Plus, sure. you're able to make your eyebrows move at a rapid pace along with your lips, which most people can't do. So there okay. you go. What? Glad that you're new to my podcast. I hope that you have given me a five star <laughs> apple. Have you, according to moi? Hi, Justin. Justin works at my work, but my work doesn't know that I have this okay. podcast. So we're going to hope that just Justin keeps it quiet. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because mm, it's a little, prof it's a little, I don't know. I don't think they'll like it. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, maybe they need to, maybe they need to hear it. They do, right, Justin? Okay. <laughs> they do, they do. All right, so shed some light for those uh, who are looking to, to hear from subjects that you talk about. Okay, yeah, so I will very, okay, good. Super duper, thank you, according to moi. Well, adult children of alcoholics. So now it's with dysfunctional families as well. So basically the term, it, it kind of, I guess, initially came about in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And it is essentially the characteristics that one develops from growing up in an alcoholic or a dysfunctional family. So initially, it was just used to describe people that grew up in an alcoholic family. But what they've realized is that other types of dysfunctional families can create an adult child. And so basically what it is, it's, it's this faulty programming that occurs when we grow up in a dysfunctional family that plays out in adulthood and it shows up in a lot of common characteristics. So some of the more common ones would be uh, issues in romantic relationships, which I totally could not relate to. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, oh, All right. Then you're the only person, then you're the only person. 
You're the only person on the planet that can't relate to that. But go yeah, ahead. I can't relate to none of that. <laughs> Got People it. Pleasing, approval seeking, um, you know, being overly concerned with other people, doing shit for other people that they should be doing for themselves. Um, what else? Um, being afraid of authority figures. Um, <clears throat> but basically what it is, it's, you know, we, we take on these characteristics as children because that's how we stayed safe, right? We learned that it was not okay to be who we were and that in order to be loved and accepted, that we had to take on these traits and they might've served us well during childhood, but then in adulthood, they fuck shit up. <laughs> when it comes to, when it comes to your life mm -hmm. and what you have seen mm -hmm. others going through, do you see others acting as if everything is okay when actually they're dealing with this being people pleasers and they try to act as if they're not? I don't know if they're acting as if they're not or if they're just unaware, right? And that's kind okay. of like a large right. reason that I wanted to do the podcast was, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I, you know, I grew up in an alcoholic family. I definitely knew that things were dysfunctional. Um, but I sure as hell didn't think that they were as... Uh, I was never physically abused. I was never sexually abused. So sure... Uh, things weren't great, but I knew that other people had it a lot worse than me. And honestly, uh, I okay. had no idea that mm -hmm. my romantic issues were related to my unresolved childhood pain. I just thought that, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I just thought that I was inherently flawed and I was really floored to learn how much my childhood really did impact me, you know? And right. so... I think that there's just a lot of people out there who are unaware of the fact that the reoccurring issues that they encounter in life, whether that's at work or in romantic relationships at home or whatever, it's probably unresolved childhood issues. And that's why we keep having them come up over and over and over. Um, and that's why we can't, that's why things don't get any better. That's why they keep popping up because we might think we're trying to deal with the issue at hand, but in reality, it's related to childhood and that's something that we're not addressing. And it isn't until we unearth, we discover kind of the root trauma of this. That was the other thing too. I didn't think that I had experienced trauma, you know, cause I thought that trauma was like one big, huge catastrophic event. Like I didn't know that, you know, um, living in a home where things were, you never knew what to expect. Like sometimes things might be good. Sometimes things might be bad. Like I didn't know that that could qualify as trauma. I didn't know that uh, my dad using me as emotional support and has his confidant since what was going on in our home was a secret to the rest of the world. Like that's mm -hmm. parentification that qualifies as abuse mm -hmm. um, and trauma. And so I was really <laughs> floored to learn that I, you know, I thought that abuse had to be intentional too. And um, I've just been, I was just floored to learn that, um, especially that I was, that I was suffering from, from a form of PTSD, it's called complex PTSD, you know, and that okay. is essentially what occurs when we are exposed to trauma over a significant period of time. And it doesn't even need to be big trauma, but it's actually more mm -hmm. damaging and more impactful than, um, experiencing just one catastrophic event. So I wanted to create this podcast because I think that there's a shitload of people out there who are oblivious to the fact that their issues in life are rooted in childhood. And, and, and these, these issues that are rooted in childhood, mm -hmm. uh, if they're not addressed, I, I, I'm going to go back to something you said that I, I believe I'm picking up. So a person will continue to repeat a certain behavior or choice of decisions is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. If they don't address that or they're not aware of it. I like what you also said. Some people, we could be not aware of something, right? Yeah. And you can't fix anything if you're not aware of it. <laughs> it didn't matter how many times uh, I promised myself. I'm not it's gonna not going to get the next relation. I'm not going to do yeah. that. I'm not going to ignore red flags. Like I'm not going to date an alcoholic. It doesn't fucking matter, you know, because my brain was hijacked. I had to rewire it, right? That's what it is. It's it's rewiring this faulty programming and unfortunately it takes time to do that. Uh, yes, exactly, or they will continue to get hurt. And so then we think, we think we're inherently flawed. We think that we're unfixable. 
um, when in reality, we just don't realize what the root of the problem is. And a person can begin to live their life feeling that they're unfixable. And, well, essentially, they'll be down on themselves, not recognizing that they can't even get to their true potential mm -hmm. because they haven't addressed the childhood trauma right? or, the, or, or can we say abuse? I, well, abuse, too? Yeah. Abuse I mean, also, right? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, you got something on the screen there from. Yes, hurt people do hurt people. Um, yeah, and you know, the other thing too, though, is um, I had this person on my TikTok, like commenting on all my videos, and <laughs> this person was, um, yes, once we see it, awareness is always the first step to change. And also, that's the thing too, is that awareness is always the first step to change, but I think it's important, at least this was my experience, that once we have awareness, that doesn't mean that we're automatically um, able to change. I think that for me at least, and I think for a lot of people, we have the awareness and then we have to sit in the awareness and be uncomfortable in it. Then we're able to make the changes, but it kind of takes some time of like, mm. oh, like at first we're like, yeah, this is what I'm doing, but I, I don't know if I'm ready to do anything about it. And then- oh. <laughs> Okay. Like, I guess. You become aware of what's going on and, and that's right. the issue. Um, sorry, I'm like at a weird like truck stop thing. Um, <laughs> Why would you now tell me that? You should have told me that when I first called <laughs> before the show. Are you sure you're okay? You're good? And just like, yeah. There's Ma hey, you know what? Maybe you're famous because of the podcast and they recognize you. No, it's like a crazy <laughs> Like, this, yeah, this woman was like yelling at this guy that was asking for money, and then she was saying, like, you don't look like you have nice clothes, you don't need money. I don't know, it's a little bit crazy here. Um, but yeah, so I had to sit in the awareness, like, you know, and I think that that's the way that it is for kind of all of my issues is, um, yeah, it, it, it. it it takes pain, it takes pain and awareness to change, um, you know, but then there's some people. Like this person that was on my TikTok, I had to get rid of their comments because they were kind of negative, but they were just like, I'm too broken to change. Like I'm past, you know, I'm past that. Hmm. Um, there's no hope for me. And that's bullshit. There's always hope for anybody. It just takes so, time. It's okay, not so let's, the best let's, thing to do. It's like, it's not easy work. And say that one more time. I kind of lost you. It's not easy work though. Like that's the thing. Yes, it's, it, there's hope. You can change. But they've got to do the work. Yeah, and it's uncomfortable. It's not fun. But now, when we, if we do the work, though, mm -hmm. the benefits are, are big enough. The payoff is big enough. What are some of the things, when somebody does the work, are the benefits that should outweigh their fear of doing the work? Well, I mean, I think that the benefits that we, we don't, it, it's, more than we could even imagine, right? It's like, okay. you know, I, I, I just wanted to stop finding, <laughs> I just wanted to stop dating emotionally unavailable alcoholic. I, I saw the post, right? I saw but, your post. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and so, but actually what has occurred and what really happens, and I think what is the real big ticket item is that we get to discover our true selves, right? Wow. We get to, um, yeah, we get to discover who we are. I mean, a lot of that, I mean, I think that the adult child syndrome, a lot of it is it's about um, our true selves going into hiding. And so it's becoming who we are. I mean, for me, it was like figuring out why was I put on this planet? Like, what are the gifts that I have? What are my strengths? Like, what, how do I, um, how do I find the apex of my, you know, personal fulfillment and my contribution to the world? Uh, yes, awareness, acceptance. So true, Heather. Um, and so um, just really discovering like who we are as people. Um, I think that we are able to experience the world and life on a deeper level. Um, we're able to help others. I think we develop compassion. I think that we get to develop like a spiritual life and ultimately what happens through the process is that you just become grateful for all of that pain, right? Because then it, it creates this life of depth and meaning. And um, if somebody told me that like I could take a pill 
like, and that none of that, you know, I wouldn't be an alcoholic. I wouldn't be an adult child. Like I would just, I wouldn't want that. I mean, I just think that, <laughs> I think that people who haven't been through stuff are boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, you oh, should make a, oh, you should make a shirt. Wait, you should make a shirt that says that and you should sell it. <laughs> people that haven't been through stuff are boring. I like that. Uh, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you something. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you should recognize it, I hope, because it's part of what we talked about in the show prep. So mm -hmm. I have to ask you this. Mm -hmm. When it comes to codependency, mm -hmm. that seems to be a subject that you said, mentioned that you were comfortable talking about. Mm -hmm. What is your take on codependency? I think it's trauma-based. Okay. Um, which is not, not, not necessarily everybody's... Um, opinion but mm -hmm. it's basically where one's um how do i describe it i mean for me it's like where the behaviors perceived behaviors actions and actions of another dictate our peace of mind Got and it. boy is that a miserable fucking place to be you know i think it's even more miserable than than drugs and alcohol honestly um codependency it is just the most miserable feeling in the whole wide world to just um you know it's crazy because it would be for me you know i would be fine whenever i was single but then as soon as i got into a relationship i feel like my peace of mind would just be hijacked um and wait, that, oh, wait, so, that wait i've got to you though that it's trauma based that that's why i'm saying okay. it's trauma, because it's like i got I got to I got to go back to that cuz somebody wrote me about what you just said and you just touched on it. Okay, so you were fine when you were single. Mm -hmm. And then you got into a relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, describe the hijacking part. So I think that's going to shed light for a lot of the viewers that don't they can't put their finger on it either, but you just said what it felt like and that actually is going to help somebody. Like it was hijacked. So what do you mean by that? If you had to touch on it a little bit more, any way to describe that a little bit more, what it was like from um, being single it, into a relationship? I mean, what would happen? It would be like as soon as like, <clears throat> it's like them not texting you back. Like after it's like you go on one date with somebody one mm -hmm. date, and then it's like then you don't hear from them the next day. And like, you're all like in your head, you're feeling like shit, or they don't text you back after. It's like, let's think about this. Like, logically, like I've been on one date with this person. I don't even know who the fuck they are. I don't even know, like, <laughs> like who, who knows? But like the fact that all of a sudden then my peace of mind, um, where it's just like, you're just totally consumed. And then as soon as they text you back, it's like immediately, it's like taking a drink, you know? Oh, okay. I get you. I get you now. Like, it's okay. And it's just, <laughs> it's, it's, soothing. Like, it's crazy how our, yeah, our peace of mind, our state of being can become like d dictated, you know, based off another person that we don't even know, which to me goes to show that it's, it has nothing to do with the person. And that was a big realization for me mm -hmm. when I finally had this realization of like, I've been dating this person for three weeks. They're mm -hmm. an alcoholic. Their parents mm -hmm. are definitely alcoholics. <laughs> and okay. I'm going to kill myself right. because they're breaking up with me. Like, there's no way that that, that can actually sense. be about that person. <laughs> there's no right, way. Right. Um, right. And so that was like kind of my big aha moment where like the tiniest bit of space was created in my head where I could see that this reaction um mm -hmm. had nothing and it just that was so freeing because i felt like such it is part of human to be loved um that's true but it's like you know it's but what you're well, what you're talking about is a little different but but go ahead uh, yeah. because you said it's um, freeing you had a little bit of space and it was freeing yeah it was just and, freeing to realize that um Cause I just thought it, I was like a loser and that I was pathetic, you know, um, like, um, that's like truly what I thought. I couldn't understand yeah. why did I become this way? Like, I didn't want to be that way. I didn't want to mm -hmm. be that way. And to realize that, especially that it was trauma, that it was like my brain had been conditioned to respond this way, you know, like, Got it. Got it. Yeah. you know, 
this is how, what was ingrained in me. Um, it's really interesting. So I, I'm sorry to my listeners. I, my podcast is supposed to come out this morning. It, it's going to come out later today. I had some technical difficulties, but um, we're talking about um, trauma bonds, which okay. is essentially, it's similar to codependency, but um, usually there's kind of some more like betrayal or manipulation or whatever. But what it talks about is like, what, what, what makes a Trump, what classifies a trauma bond is typically it is, they call it, um, what do they call it? It's like inconsistent positive reinforcement. So basically, okay. sometimes they treat you well, and sometimes they treat you like shit. And when when a relationship is all bad, it's a little bit easier to to walk away from that. Well, Although right, I wouldn't pass right. it, I, but I wouldn't put it past an adult child to easily stay in an all bad relationship. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. But oh, well. you know, it's like when it's they hit you, and then they shower you with love and affection or they yes. tell you you're a piece of shit and then they take you shopping. And it's like, we just will take even like the tiniest like bit of breadcrumbs of love or what we perceive to be love and eat that shit up, you know? And so it's, um, and so then what happens is that our brain gets addicted to this, this cocktail that's formed with like, um, what is it? I don't know, serotonin and oxytocin, but basically <laughs> They're chemicals that are created from like the, hi, how you doing little, um, Adriana, she, she, uh -huh. she's a friend. Um, so basically what happens is that our brain gets addicted to that, to like the cycles of love and abuse, love and abuse, or like, um, neglect and attention, neglect and attention. Our brain gets addicted to those cycles. Wow. Uh -huh. Um, and so that's why, that's why we go back because it's not necessary it's not really a choice like our brain has been conditioned that way so um how do you I break that huh? how, how does it how does a how does a young person or, or anybody how does a, I mean, a woman yeah how does somebody break that or start to work I, work their way away from that other than going cold turkey therapy therapy okay so i mean there you know i think that the <laughs> I think that the, the 12 steps are great. Um, but in my opinion, when it comes to these issues, um, I don't know. Will this be uh, it's going to, it's when I upload it, um, uh, Andrea will be able to, to download it and have it for her, her no. server. She get to keep it for forever, but we'll okay. talk about that after the show. Go ahead. Okay. You were going to say, bye. Good night. <laughs> bye. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh, therapy. You were th so I think yeah. that the reason that it needs to be done in therapy is because what we're dealing with is trauma. Um, but here's the problem. There's not, it's hard to find a good, bye. It's hard to find a good therapist. I think that really understands this stuff. I mean, I, I just think that there's not, and actually I'm waiting for my interview with Dr. Drew to come up, but we talked about this, about how there's just such a lack mm -hmm. of, um, of good therapists that can kind of kind of cover this stuff because here's the deal it's like when it comes to this stuff like adult child stuff especially just like the dynamics of a dysfunctional family the generational natures of dysfunctional family i think it's almost even more kind of difficult to understand than like alcoholism or addiction um i don't know there's just like all these like dynamics that i just feel like somebody really needs to know it like the back of their like it's just unless you've lived it or um, yeah, I just think that it's, I don't know. I just think that there's like a lot why, of therapists. Why do you think that's a, a challenge? I know you, you did, uh, you did a, you did a show with Dr. Drew Pinsky, right? If I'm, if I'm, if I'm saying that right, I just want to make sure I saw a posting like that. So now, now you're saying he even mentioned that's not something that's easy for someone else to, to work with someone on. Why do you think it's a challenge? If you really had to say. I just think it's, um, I think it's the same reason why it's, how do I say it? I just I can't believe you just said, how can I say it? You, you are not short on words. I know, I know <laughs> but I'm just trying to think how do I explain it to other people like, yes. where it makes sense. Cause I mean, it makes sense in my head perfectly. Um, I think it's, I just think that it's hard for people to understand. I don't know how to, I just think that it's hard for people to understand 
if they haven't lived it. I mean, it basically goes to show, like, I didn't know what my problem was for so long, you know? Like, right, right, and I just right. think that that's part of it. Um, I just think that it's kind of like in the same way that, um, like with alcoholism and addiction, how I think that in mm -hmm. order, like it, I think treatment is much better when it's somebody that has, um, hands-on experience per se, yeah, or, or, yeah. or worked with somebody that, that, uh, they really are close to it and are able to help them. So kind of this, this, I, this is the same. Well, I just think that it's just like, there's just like really like just subtle dynamics. Like my okay. therapist just knows this shit like the back of her hand. And I just think that it's like, unless you really understand it, you really understand the family system. The other thing too is like that it hasn't been, this is kind of like a newer thing that's, there's not a Got ton it. of, yeah. um, right. you know, it's only been in the past couple of years. Um, and same thing with like complex PTSD and stuff like that. We're mm -hmm. just starting to understand the brain. But yes. I just think that um, I just think that not a lot of they might people might be aware of trauma and like the dysfunctional family system, but on a more kind of like broader level, right? Um, okay. But versus somebody like I think you really really have to understand it. Hey, girl. Mm -hmm. um, hi Colleen in order to to really understand it um because you know I had a therapist she was wonderful I worked with her for many years she understands trauma but she doesn't understand the the family disease of alcoholism or what I consider to be more so like the the family disease of or the disease of family dysfunction um so yeah I just think that not everybody I don't know it's just they may so they may understand certain parts of being or they may be what they say trauma informed but they may not understand well, but i like the way you just said the two you said the disease of alcoholism in the family as well as family dysfunction as a disease yeah I that, think it's the same you make thing. a very good that's a very good point i like that i think that there's just a lot of nuances with it and that not not many people understand it i mean honestly i'm not a trained like therapist or no. whatever but no. i think that i could help like people like more so than probably i don't know 80 well, percent you, you know what i noticed <laughs> what i noticed about your page mm -hmm. uh, the first time i saw it you said it just now but i i i never looked at it this way until you just said it a few moments ago you actually create space in people's in in, in a person's mind so they can make sense of what they're going through Mm -hmm. You're very good at it. Now, don't get a big head. I'm gonna give you a compliment. Very so, one. so, so <laughs> smart, Alex. So, so, you you have a way of saying and doing things, even your videos, that you make people think about what they're doing in response to what someone else either is doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you're very good at it. I'm not gonna keep going on that because I, I want to ask you this. I want to ask you as many things as possible before we have to go. So, I'm gonna ask you now about. Uh, something we talked about in the show prep, toxic shame. What's your take on toxic shame? So toxic shame is internalized shame. So when a, an emotion is internalized, it no longer functions as an emotion and it becomes one's identity. So uh, okay. when shame is internalized, um, that person no longer feels shame. They believe that they are shame. And uh, there's like a wonderful um, book uh, by D John Bradshaw, it's called Healing the Shame That Binds Us. And so basically what he talks about in that book is that once shame is internalized, it can go one of two ways. The first is shameless acting in. And so that is when a person essentially feels the need to be perfect to avoid any possible situation where they could feel shame. Uh, you know, so it. going out of their way to just avoid shame in all situations. And then the other version is shameful acting out, which is what I did. And that's where we like lean into the shame and act accordingly. The thing is, is that both of these just create more shame. Um, you know, they're, they're, I mean, I don't, I feel like maybe the shameless acting in would be like a little bit less painful than the shameful acting out. But, um, uh. but that's what it is. It's like, and, and so then that's why we, we find ourselves in, um dysfunctional and unhealthy relationships with people because that's what we believe we deserve hi lindsay um and the thing is at least for me what was crazy is that i consciously 
I thought I ha- I thought that I loved myself. Like I thought mm-hmm. I thought I had high self esteem. Like I could tell you, like I could tell you, I think I'm pretty. I think I'm smart. I think I'm funny. Right, right. I think I'm a good catch. But the reality was was that my actions were were showing otherwise. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like mm-hmm. my the way that I was behaving, especially in romantic relationships, showed that I did not think very highly of myself. Um, so I think that that's kind of like the crazy part of all of this stuff is, is just how under the surface and like subconscious it can be. Like, I really had no idea, but then it's like, when I go back through my history and I just look at all the different things that happen, it like, it totally makes sense. But I think that's also part of it too. It's like the disease of like family dysfunction of all that kind of stuff. It's so fucking sneaky. Um, and it it, it, it just tries to survive and thrive in whatever way it can. And I think in one way, it's like, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't even know that it's there, but if we like consciously, like another thing too, which I think is great when I was um, researching stuff about trauma bonds is like one way to know that if you're, you're in a, like a trauma bond relationship is if, um, would like, would you want your family member or friend <laughs> okay. to be in good. that relationship? Um, good question. Yeah. That's good. So for That's me, good. I feel like every single relationship that I was in, like I would have said no, but like I still would have stayed in it. Like it doesn't <laughs> matter, but at least that's like a good way to, you know, that's a good judge. Well, well, well you just you shed some light on that. Now I got to get to another one. Um, I hope you're not dying in that car there. You, hopefully it's nice and cool. I'm not sure. But it's really hot. Okay. All right. Here we're going to do this. Okay. Scapegoat. Scapegoating. You're, Yes. scapegoating yeah your take on that so scapegoating identified patients so that was me so in dysfunctional families there are different roles right so there's typically i mean initially it was developed uh with an alcoholic family in mind so typically like there would be the alcoholic um but that could be like the addict that could be the abuser that could be the um i don't know the mentally ill and so that's typically one of the two parents and then the other parent is typically the enabler. And then the kids mm-hmm. play different roles. So one is the hero. So that's the kid that's like the straight aid student, the kid that never gets into trouble. And basically like they are trying to portray to the outside world that there aren't any issues in the family. Um, and they also feel like by being perfect that somehow they're gonna save the family. Then you have mm-hmm. like the lost child. They just kind of keep to themselves, they're quiet. Then you have the mascot who uses um, like humor and comedy as a way to like take, you know, distract from what's actually going on in the home. Right. Um, and then you have the scapegoat. And so with the scapegoat, it's like, it could be, I think most of the time or a lot of the time what happens is the, the parents almost peg, like they pick the scapegoat in a way, like sometimes, and that's how it was for me. It was like, um, I mean, the way that it worked with me is that, you know, I developed separation anxiety, like when I was seven or eight years old and, um, my parents sent me to a therapist and I remember years later asking my mom, like, Hey, um, did you ever tell the therapist that you were an alcoholic and that you and dad fought all the time? And it was like, no, of course not. Right. Like I was the problem. And so I became, I, I call it like the identified patient, but basically, so initially I wasn't really like trying to be the scapegoat, but kind of like the toxic shame thing. Like I leaned into that. And so then I stepped it up and, um, and started using drugs and alcohol. But here's the thing. It worked. It worked in the sense that when I started to drink and use drugs, my parents had to come together to deal with me. My mom wasn't Mm. as much and my parents stopped fighting. So it did, you know, it worked in Mm. a way. Because they had to wow. deal with me, you know? But what happens is just then, it, you know, it, it continues, right? Like, and unfortunately, um, even at 12 years of sobriety and, like, everything that I've done, like, my my parents will still try to um, put me in that role. As a scapegoat. As mm-hmm. a... Yeah. Could, what, I'm just going to ask. So why do you think they do that? Does that just work for them to keep you in that role and, and oh, give it, them a no, sense it's, of it's, purpose? It's, it's, no, it's it's so that they don't have to look at themselves. That's what it Got is. It. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, you know. It's not, it's not even, it's not conscious. Oh, it's not. 
No. It's just the way the brain is working. That's just the way it works because of the alcohol. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or it's not, <laughs> I mean, typically it's, no, it's not. I mean, it's just a way to deflect and not have to look at like oneself. Um, you, you, um, you're a very intelligent woman. Thank you. You're a very bright, intelligent woman. I really am glad that we were able to, to do a show together. But um, before you go, I need you to make sure you tell everybody how to find you and follow you or subscribe and show support for your podcast for sure, without a doubt. Yes. Now, I've got, I've got on here that you got a website. Um, um, correct me if I say anything wrong. But you have a website, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they can go to your website. Please tell everybody where's your website. Adultchildpodcast.com. You can find okay. the podcast anywhere. Adult child. Please give me a five star rating <laughs> on Apple. I and love you. You're so funny. You're a horrible person if you don't do that. <laughs> Start at the beginning. Start in episode one. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, it'd be great if you can. Like, no, do it or else I'll figure <laughs> yeah. out who you are. And that's right. It won't be good. And you, that's right. It's that's not right. Be good she, for you. She means it. Matter of fact, she means it. Matter of fact. I just fact, want to say, so my podcast, my episode will be dropping either later tonight or okay. tomorrow. But you guys, this is such a good interview. So I'm talking to this guy and his mother was a Holocaust survivor. And this Whoa. is a fascinating, fascinating story. You, you are, I think you, you are one of those people that, that uh, gets overlooked that people should never underestimate. Mm. You are without a doubt, one of a kind. I have over here, there, I've got monitors around here and I'm looking at you on a big screen, but I have something over here in regards to your page. I just got to do this before you, before we have to go, but I, I mean, hopefully I can pull it up. Oh, here it came up. Just bear with me. I've got to read something that you post. Read something that you posted. Oh, chewy pooey. <laughs> That's not a common term. But hold on one second here. I gotta see if I pull this up. Here. <laughs> just uh, I just had it and I just lost it. It's been one of those mornings. But I'm glad you are the first person I did a show with. Uh, coming back after taking some time off. Just hold on here. I'm gonna read something to you. Okay, here we go. What is ego lens versus divine lens? Mm. So, so basically, divine lens, I think it's easier to describe what divine, divine lens is versus ego. Divine lens is essentially viewing all of our pain as serving a purpose. So instead of confronting, instead of going to our problems, being like, why is this happening to me? Um, mm -hmm. I don't deserve this. It's realizing that there's some higher purpose that this is serving. Um, and mm -hmm embracing our pain and using it as opportunities to grow as humans and to benefit the world. So um, I'm so grateful. Like my great, it's a divine lens is all about the understanding that our greatest pain is our greatest gifts and our greatest blessings. And that's totally been my experience. Right. Okay. The ego lens then what is the ego lens? <sighs> like what I'm saying, like, it's like, why is this that's happening the, to me? Why is it happening yeah, to me? Okay. And also it's just, it's, it's essentially like living life as if life is just meaningless and it's all just random, you know, that the shit okay. that happens to us is Got meaningless. Hi, CJ. Yeah. CJ and I grew up together. We were best friends. Oh, first grade. Cool. First grade. Okay. Yep. That's yeah. And cool. we used to like, we used to like say that we were going to create like our own swim teams. Like when we were like eight, we would like call up sports stores and be like, ask them how much swimsuits would cost. I don't know. It was really weird. Do you remember that, CJ? <laughs> okay. If that is not in one of your podcasts, you need to put it in. That That's pretty good. That's a good little story right there. I like that. Yeah. Listen. And then one time me and CJ were in yeah. an elevator with Vanna White. <laughs> that's okay. Remember that, CJ? You need, to, you need to start a podcast with that story. Okay. That you were in an elevator with Vanna White, and I you need to hash, hash, post it. And hash, oh my goodness! You see now, at some point when you're um, when you're not super duper busy and can come back, I'd can love fit to. me fit me in your famous schedule. You have to do exactly what you did today. Come on and do all the talking. But I've got other stuff on this that I wrote from the mm -hmm. from the from the show prep. I haven't even touched on, but uh, I, I've run out of time for today. Uh, and my voice, thank you for letting me warm up my voice for the rest of the second half of my season. But I wanted to make sure you were the first person I did a show with mm -hmm. because I really, like, 
I really like you as a human being. You you have an amazing mind. Thank you're, you. You're a very intelligent person. Thank but you. your personality your personality is 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 it's in you a mean? race. It's in a race with your intelligence because both of them are very high. <laughs> very, very, you get a great sense of humor. By the way, any more rice cakes uh, that you have, or did you you got rid of all of them? You downed them all. No, I'm gonna eat it. Yeah. Drive back. You get to- eat. I'm on my way back from LA, so I was down there for a couple of days. So I gotta. Oh, cool. Get back to the city, cool. my kitty. All right. Well, you. I expect to see you know wonderful things from you. I I, yeah. I expect to be sitting in an old folks' home. And looking at my television and seeing you walk across the Academy Awards stage getting your Oscar. I don't know some about doc- that, but let's some see documentary. Well, you know, some movie that you did or some, no, some you I know, like your life story. Uh, yeah, I think you would be good. No, I think you would be a good independent uh, movie maker. I think cool. you would be good at it. You would be good. All right, look, Paxton's got to go. Andrea has uh, landed here on Open Session Podcast. I hope this, I didn't tell you this, but I'm going to say it now. Um, I hope that you, we will be able to find a way that we can work together again on my Narc Abuse TV page. I'd love to. Uh, um, when you have time. Um, I, I, I know you're busy. No, no. You, 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 the videos you make are funny. Uh, I know I, I, okay, I know I said I got to go, but I got to mention this one video. You yeah. did this video, okay, where I guess the guy didn't call you back or something like that. Uh, no, I go. Okay. That, yes, you seriously, <laughs> that. That's you need to make a movie. You need to make a you need to make movie shorts, little 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 short movies with stuff like that. You're very good at it. Great actress, by the way. Great actress. Good. Was I was real. believing. That was real. Wait, I was ready to beat him up for you because it's go like, oh, you didn't call her back. That's messed up. All right. Thanks a lot. You stay the same. Don't change a thing and don't listen to any right, knuckleheads or trolls. I even if I could. Yeah. Keep your podcast going. Everybody, please like, comment, share, follow Andrea at her Instagram yeah. page. Yeah. Check out her um, her website. But whatever you do, give her five stars, yeah. please. Are you going <laughs> it's, to hell? it's not hard. Yeah. <laughs> You're the best. All right, I gotta go. I will see you later. Bye, Stay guys. the same. Take Thank care. You. Bye. All right, bye.